and Merry Christmas. What a beautiful night. What an amazing time. This is the evening that really pulls at our heartstrings, that fills us with that gift of love, that gift of Christ. A father declared that Christmas was going to be different this year. He called a family conference and challenged his family to be a bit more disciplined in their management of their time and also their spending of money during the Christmas season. They had to curtail excessive spending on gifts especially. He talked about better relations between when the relatives visit and just a better, happier atmosphere around the home. He brought his speech to a crescendo with his final rally cry, let's make this the best Christmas ever. But then we looked at him and his second grade son said, but dad, I don't see how you could ever improve on the very first Christmas. And he's right. We can't. We welcome you to our service this evening that's filled with hope, that's filled with peace, joy, and love. We're so glad you're here to help celebrate the birth of Jesus, the light of the world. Let's take a moment to prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. Please rise and join me in the litany of darkness and light found on page 880 in your memo. 880. We wait in the darkness expectantly, longingly, anxiously, thoughtfully. The darkness is our friend. 
In the darkness of the womb, we have all been nurtured and protected. In the darkness of the womb, the Christ child was made ready for the journey into light. You are the of our God, in darkness and in light. It is only in the darkness that we can see the splendor of the universe, blankets of stars, the solitary glowings of distant planets. It was the darkness that allowed the Magi to find the star that guided them to where the Christ child lay. You know us, the God, in darkness and in light. In the darkness of night, desert peoples found relief from the cruel, relentless heat of the sun. In the blessed desert darkness, Mary and Joseph were able to flee with the infant Jesus to safety in Egypt. You are with us, O God, in darkness and in light. In the darkness of sleep, we are soothed and restored, healed and renewed. In the darkness of sleep, dreams rise up. God spoke to Jacob and Joseph through dreams. God is speaking still. You are with us, O God, in darkness and in light. In the solitude of darkness, we sometimes remember those who need God's presence in a special way. The sick, the unemployed, the bereaved, the persecuted, the homeless, those who are demoralized and discouraged, those whose fear has turned to cynicism, those whose vulnerability has become bitterness. Sometimes in the darkness, we remember those who are near to our hearts, colleagues, partners, parents, children, neighbors, friends. We thank God for their presence and ask God to bless and protect them in all that they do, at home, at school, as they travel, as they work, as they play. You are with us, O God, in darkness and in light. Sometimes in the solitude of darkness, our fears and concerns, our hopes and our visions rise to the surface. We come face to face with ourselves and with the road that lies ahead of us. And in that same darkness, we find companionship for the journey. In that same darkness, we sometimes allow ourselves to wonder and worry whether the human race is going to survive. We know you are with us, O oh God. Yet we still await your coming in the darkness that contains both our hopelessness and our excitement. We watch for the sign of God's hope. Tonight is the night for which we have been waiting. The Advent wreath is completed except for the Christ candle, which is in the center. For unto us a child is given, unto us a Savior is born, and the order of the world will be upon his shoulders. With the birth of Christ, our lives are centered, they are focused, they are turned toward God. We light this candle because Christ is the center of our lives. Please join me in prayer as found in your bulletin. Loving God, on this night as we celebrate the birth of Jesus, let the power of Christ come into our hearts that we might find peace with you forever. Amen. Please join in our hymn of gathering, Joy to the World, number 132. Amen.
Confessing our sins unto God our Father, so that we might be granted forgiveness. Please rise for our call to confession. And let us pray. You have given us new life, God, in the birth of your Son. We celebrate his birth with joy, but we return to the living the old life. Forgive us when we take only the celebration. And leave your grace and mercy unclaimed. Help us to experience the real gift this Christmas and live the new life that Jesus has brought to us. In his name we pray. Amen. Hear these words of comfort from the prophet Isaiah. Surely God is our salvation. We will trust and we will not be afraid. For the Lord God is our strength and our might. God has become our salvation. Open yourselves to the hope that is found in forgiveness. Never more do we be held captive by that which seeks to tear us away from God. Hear the good news of the gospel, for we are indeed forgiven. Please be seated. The Gospel Scripture is from Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, 
and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise and let's join in hymn number 148, The Child is This. <laughs> Yeah. 
Please be seated. O oh Lord, correct our thinking, our speaking, and our hearing, that we may more fully know you, and let your word be our lamp in all darkness and in doubt. Amen. As Christmas 1865 was approaching, an insurance salesman sat down and wrote a poem one afternoon, and he entitled it, The Manger Throne. William Dix imagined visitors walking by a manger 2,000 years ago, confused about who the child was that lay before them. <coughs> From this perspective, Dix wrote a story of this child's birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. But it was not until an unknown Englishman took Dix's poem and combined it with the melody Green Sleeves that it became a world famous Christmas carol. What child is this? It seems to me that it's very fitting to ask that question all over again. What child is this? There's much debate as to exactly who the child was. Muslims, for example, believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, just like the Christians do. But they see him as a great prophet, and they call him Jesus, the son of Mary, a great man but nothing more than a prophet. Many Jewish people now see Jesus as a great teacher, a political performer, if you will, but nothing more. Hindus have come to revere Jesus as a self-realized saint who reached the highest state of God consciousness. Who to see him as a bodhisattva, which is a perfectly enlightened being, full of compassion, who helps other people. But none of these other world religions see Jesus as Christians see Jesus. So the question remains, what child is this? Well, 700 years before Jesus Christ was even born, a prophet of God explained Christmas before anyone had ever experienced Christmas. Seven centuries before that cradle rocked, before the stars shone and the wise men gave and the angels sang, Isaiah dipped his prophetic pen into inspired ink and wrote what has become the centerpiece and the cornerstone of Christmas prophecy. Walking in the past, looking to the future, giving good news for the present, Isaiah tells us just who this child was. In this child, Isaiah says, we see God's promise. <coughs> First we're told, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Now in those two thoughts, there are two really tremendous truths. A child is born. That speaks of the humanity of Jesus. A son is given. That speaks of the deity of Jesus. The first phrase tells us he is the son of man. The second tells us he is the son of God. One tells us of his earthly beginning, the other tells us of his eternal being. One tells us he's the babe in Bethlehem. One tells us he is the God of glory. As a child, he was born to live with us. As a son, he was given to die for us. So God comes, clothed not only in the vulnerability that he calls us also to live. God comes and inhabits the promise of new life. 
God powerfully reaffirms the sacred promise of new life as the child comes among us. Emmanuel, God with us. Isaiah goes on. For with this child, he says, he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Jesus has many names, and Isaiah points out four specific ones, with each name representing a way that this child will gladden the grieving, heal the hurting, and save the sinner. For the hurting, he is the wonderful counselor. Jesus doesn't give advice. He doesn't even give opinions. He gives truth. He will never steer you wrong. When you let Jesus be your counselor, the only thing you can say is, wonderful. For the hopeless, he is the mighty God. Now, as a wonderful counselor, he can tell you what is right. But as a mighty God, he can empower you to do what is right. Because as long as there is God, there is hope. As long as there is God, there is help. As long as there is God, there is healing. For there is nothing impossible with God. For the hopeless, he is the mighty God. For the helpless, he is the everlasting Father. Literally translated, it says, he is the Father of eternity. Now in the Jewish mind, a father <clears throat> denoted the source of something or the origin of something. Jesus is the father of all things that pertain to eternity. So that means he's never late. That means he's never early. Jesus is always on time. And most importantly, he is always there when you need him to be. When you need him to be there. He is always there when you need him most. For the helpless, he is the eternal Father. And for the heartbroken, he is the Prince of Peace. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. As we have seen all too often, the peace of this world can become shattered by a sneak attack, a sniper's bullet or a terrorist bomb. But the peace that Jesus gives can weather any storm. Jesus can give you a peace that will last, even if the world is in chaos around you. You need to understand something about that little baby born in that manger more than 2,000 years ago. The world needs him. The hurting need him. The hopeless need him. The helpless need him. The heartbroken need him. With this child, we share God's grace. On Christmas Day, 1988, a beautiful story appeared in the New York Daily News titled, Remember, It is Love That Makes Us Rich. Now, the story tells about a place in Edinburgh, Scotland. It's called the Museum of Childhood. The museum is filled with childhood treasures of the upper classes. It has elegant teddy bears, puppets, rocking horses, and cases and cases, and even more cases of dolls. But in one corner, one solitary corner, there is a case, and inside that case is a rather worn, raggedy doll, much the worse for wear. A sign on the case says, doll belonging to London slum child, 
circa 1905. To look at that dog, it's a sad and dreary dog. It'll bring tears to your eyes because it just looks so pitiful. It'll bring tears to your eyes because it also looks so beautiful. Because some child loved it so much. The author of the article adds these meaningful words. If you cannot appreciate the story of that raggedy dog, you cannot appreciate the story of Christmas. A pitiful doll loved into beauty. A pitiful doll loved into beauty. If you think about it, that's us. We are that doll. Who are we that God should love us so? Nothing to recommend us. Nothing at all except God's love. What child is this? That child is the love that came down to us at Christmas. It is God's gift given to us. It is the Son of Man, the Son of God, the wonderful Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This child is where we can see God's promise, experience God's grace, and also have God's guidance throughout our lives, always. Amen. So tonight, I'm, it's such a pleasure to be here to sing for everyone. And um, some people can't be here, as we know because it's hard to get here or whatever. But it really isn't about being here physically. As we said in the first part about darkness and light, we could be anywhere in the world right now. We could be here, or we could be sitting at our home. And this is for specifically for Judy tonight, because I know you'd love to be here, but you are here for all of us, everyone. So... <laughs> Oh, 
chains shall he break, for the slave is a brother, and in his name oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus raise me, let all within us praise his holy to think of those people who can't be with us tonight, those who are on our prayer list, those who have passed. Our church has symbols of them around. The angel, that's right down here in the front, was one of my dad's favorites. He always loved that at this time of year. Our cross that comes across here from Pastor Jean. Over here, our manger scene. Taking a look at this, Jerry Picard. We've had four very special ladies who have passed away this year. We have something of theirs that's right here in the church. This was knitted by Kathy Nyman. Ornamented the ice cream cone hanging here. Nancy Bittler. The picture of the church in the back was painted by Ilza Munzinger. And Sue Rodinger. How beautiful this is. I remember when she first brought this in and thought about how gorgeous and it just kind of lights up everything. She's a special gold thread in it. Just exquisite. Christmas is a time to appreciate what is happening today in the present, to remember the past, and to look forward to what's going on into the future. We have those symbols around us and we hold them in our hearts always. What are joys and concerns anyone would like to bring forward at this time? Let us have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, your entrance into this world amazes us with its gentle power. The child of Mary, infant sign of your infinite love, seems as a solitary candle in the vastness of night, or as a single breath of warmth in a world chilled by separateness and uncaring. And yet tonight we celebrate, because your love revealed in Christ possessed the power to thaw any coldness of heart. How grateful are we that your light penetrated into human history in that Bethlehem stable. Then and there you coupled the ordinary and the sacred. You identified the joy and wonder of being surprised by grace. We pray on this Christmas Eve that wherever there is gloom, 
wherever there's a situation of dimness or loss of hope, that our faith may shine. And that we will rise to the occasion with our spirits of flame. We will leave this place tonight with thanks in our hearts. For with the birth of your Son, a light dawn that cannot be extinguished. Tonight as we pass the candle flame, hand to hand, may we sense deep within our being the contagious, continuous quality of our faith. May we depart kindled in spirit, light bearers to the world. In the name of Jesus, as he taught us to pray. Our Father, Lord, our heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as this is now. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. And the light is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. special one I would like to say thank you Jen for being at the organ tonight it was so greatly appreciated thank you our offering this evening will the ushers come forward at this time
Let us join our hymn of communion, Be Known to Us in Breaking Bread, number 342. Join with me in our service of communion is found in the insert in your bulletin. The prophets foretold it. The desert burst into bloom. Angelic messengers delivered news. A priest lost his speech. A young woman found her voice. In the season of Advent, the scriptures revive old stories and bring new understandings. In the face of critics and skeptics, our faith cries out, resilient, like a baby from a manger bed. From that Bethlehem beginning, Jesus baptized in the Jordan, spent his life serving others that all might know the compassionate attention of a loving God. Today, Jesus serves us yet again. As we gather at this table, he prepares for us. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, you remain a sacred mystery to us. You have brought good news for all the people, and we will not be afraid, for you are here. We are hungry for your love, which surpasses all understanding. We are thirsty for your spirit that never runs dry. In this field, nourish our souls. Feed our mouths, quench our deepest longings, and forgive our transgressions, that we may glorify you every day of our lives. Amen. Please be seated. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And having blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup, and after he had supped, gave it to his disciples, saying, this is the New Testament of my blood, which is shed for you. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Come, for things are now ready.
body of Christ, which is broken for you, take and eat. Amen. The blood of Christ, which is shed for you, take and drink. Amen. Please rise and let us pray. Holy Creator, bread of life, life and everlasting salvation, the light shines in the night, and the night will not overcome it. In this meal, we have been replenished and strengthened. The light of your love rekindled within. We will be bold to carry this light into the world. Thank you for recharging our batteries 
and reviving the ambient glow within us. You are the power source that never gives out, eternally renewable and sustainable. Thank you, God. Thank you, Christ. Thank you, Spirit. Amen. The candle lighting service, of course, is one of the biggest traditions of our Christmas Eve. We'll be singing that most famous carol, Silent Night, number 101. As we sing, the ushers will be coming forward. One oh four. One oh one in the red room. I like the lyrics in the red room. Sing whatever lyrics you would prefer. All right. I know which ones I'll be singing, but uh, yeah, one thirty four. If you want to grab along with those lyrics, that's great. Um, the ushers will be coming forward to light the candles. As they do, keep your candle upright. Let them come and light it, and you hold it upright. The next person can light it from that as we go through the service. When we get to the last part, the last verse of hymn 134, or wherever you're singing at that point, we'll be singing a cappella. We'll be dimming the lights as we go through.
Prepare to receive the coming of the light. Discover in the silence a carol sound. A child comes to us this night, and the love of God abounds. Christ the Savior is born. Amen. Thank you. 